A child's life is filled with wonder. A child's life is filled with imagination. A child's life is filled with dirty laundry and messy rooms. How many parents say preach? I love my beautiful kids. I have four beautiful ones. This is my picture of my family. Beautiful kids, four of them. Two biological, two adopted kids. And I, I love my daughters. They're, they're so sweet. And everybody that has only daughters, they live this parallel life where they can sit down and enjoy books and color and read. My daughter, Farrah, is like, Dad, how can I help? How can I help you, Dad? Being a parent to boys is a different ball game. How many know this? The Leons are like, that's true. Four, parent, four boys over there. You are always on your toes. It's always adventure. And I have boys that are boys. And you know what I mean when we say that. So they are in the mess. And I love my sons. Now, my son, Justice, the, the tall one there, he is now Mr. Cool. He is so cool now. So you meet him today, be like, what's up? And give you a fist bump, right? But when he was young, he was into everything. I mean, we were the household that not only had like those little plastic locks on your on your cabinets, we had the magnetic locks because homeboy could break into anything. If you had candy in the house, we'd find wrappers hitting under beds and couches. Like this boy knew how to do it. I mean, we'd walk in and we'd see him climbing up cabinets to grab licorice from old Halloween candy. You name it, he could find it. So we were really grateful to have a backyard that he could play in. And one day, I love to cook. My friend Chip can attest. He's my other fellow chef friend here. But I love to cook. I'm cooking in the kitchen one day and Justice comes in. It's dad, dad. Now that's Kingston's voice, but we're just going to use Kingston's voice today because it's way better for the story. So dad, dad. I said, what's up, son? He said, there's a worm in the backyard. And I said, of course there's a worm in the backyard. It's a backyard. Go out and play. So dad, big worm. I said, son, just leave the worm alone. Go back outside and play. Cook in the kitchen. He comes back in. He's like, dad, big worm. I said, I understand. Leave the worm alone. He's like, it's in my tent. And we had one of those pop-up tents, right? You know, those little pop-up tents with like cars on the side. So I said, well, just throw it out of the tent. He's like, cat's too big. I said, okay, well, let's go deal with the worm. You know, so I washed my hands, you know, finished, you know, cooking what I can. Go out there and I look in his tent and I'm like, there's no worm. He's like, underneath the tent. I open, pull over the tent. There's a giant king snake under his tent. I'm like, that's not a worm. He said, worm. I'm like, that's a snake. That's a snake. What do they teach you in preschool? That's a snake. <laughs> and so I shoved the tent back on it. It is huge, man. I mean, this is a pastor preacher, right? It feels like this big. It's probably this big, but that's how it felt. <laughs> and so I go and I'm like, what do I get? So I get, I get this giant like leaf shovel. And so now Sienna's running out. Kingston's running out. And they're I'm like, get away. We don't want to go near the snake. So I pull off the tent. And then I get my shovel and I lift it up and I can't get this snake on the shovel. And now it's aggressive. It starts biting at my shovel. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, back away from the snake. He sits there. I go and get another shovel because I'm going to collapse it, bring the trash can over. And so as I pick it up, it strikes at the, at the shovel. And now I get him up. And as I go to put him in the trash can, he leaps towards my kids. And so, you know, you get this instant primal instinct and you see your faces, you know, the kids' faces going to tear and everything goes in slow motion right? And this lands on the ground and you're like, what do you do? And I go full on John Wick on this snake. And I start hitting this. They're like, dad, kill the snake, kill the snake. I'm hitting the snake. This is not a pee to safe message. I'm just warning you. And I hit this snake and I sever its head. I'm like, you ain't going near my kids, right? And there's my kids like, oh, and then they're cheering like, dad, you saved us. Dad, you saved us. You know when you feel like a hero in your house? It's the best feeling. And there I'm going to discard the snake. I put it on the shovel. And Jessica goes, Dad, can we keep it? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> this is not a pet. No decapitated snake in my house, right? See, snakes are this symbol of fear. There are many situations, many creatures that produce fear in our lives. I mean, spiders, right? Heights, public speaking. But fear, or snakes, according to Gallup, is the number one fear for Americans. 51%. Say that snakes are the greatest thing that they would fear. Throughout history and culture and literature, snakes have been a symbol of fear. For example, the god Deimos in Greek, the son of Aphrodite, uh, his symbol was the snake. 
So snake was often associated with fear. You find snakes all throughout movies. We have the famed scene of Indiana Jones. You have Harry Potter, most recently Squid Game. The main villain has a, a tattoo of a snake on his face. They're often communicated as adversaries or enemies. But the greatest enemy of the snake, the serpent image, is depicted in the Bible. It's the main descriptor that God chooses to describe Satan, the enemy, the deceiver, Revelation 12. And I heard a loud voice saying, now the salvation and the power has come to the kingdom of our God against this serpent, this snake, this adversary. Now here's the key part of this passage. Though this adversary is intimidating, we need not to be afraid because we have overcome by the blood of the lamb. We have conquered, that's the verse, the word Nike, where we get the word Nike, that literally means conquering victory. He's allowed us to take authority over that which is coming to intimidate us, over that which is coming to, to really break apart our families, break apart the call on our life. Revelation chapter 12 says, behold, church, his wrath is great. See, now he's pivoted. He's been removed from his place of authority through the cross, but he's pivoted. His wrath is great, and it's now targeted against those that hold the testimony of Jesus. How many here hold the testimony of Jesus? And so for us, we feel this war. We are in the fight for our lives. And this fight is not a traditional fight. Any fighters here, any MMA, boxing, karate, you've thought about it in your head. You watch Bruce Lee movies. We, we have this idea that if you see an adversary, you're going to be able to fight that adversary with fists or knives or weapons. But this fight is not natural. It's spiritual. It is a different style of fight. And you, can't, you can take that fighter's mentality, but the weapons aren't natural. There are new weapons you have to learn, the place of intercession, prayer, and faith. See, it's in this fight that faithfulness matters. And the Lord is training you to stay faithful in the midst of the fight. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers. Over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is the fight we are in, and the enemy is after you. But here's the thing we have to understand. The illusion is that he can conquer you. He can't. He's been defeated. You hold that in you. You have the conquering spirit in you through the blood of Jesus. But what he can do is get you to quit. He can't conquer you, but he can get you to quit. He can get you to give it up, to throw in that towel. And he's after you for that. See, we give way too much credit to the enemy. Here's the deal. We establish omniscience on him. No, only God is omniscient. We establish omnipotence on him. No, only God is all powerful. He is finite. He is strategically in one place. Satan ain't everywhere. It doesn't work that way. But he sends his minions. He sends those demons after you or agreements your family has made. You ever faced those before? Those things in your household, like something ain't right. You need to take authority over those. He sends them out. And here's the other illusion. We think that he can read our thoughts. He can't. There's nowhere in scripture that says that. But he knows the predictive patterns and he makes it feel like you can't get away. See, his strategy is try to separate you from the good shepherd. And if he can come in and intimidate you, but here's the beauty. It's that God knows that when he's leading us, he's taking us into new ground, new dangerous territory. As we talked about this subject on Tuesday, which altered the message completely, we started to talk about the unprecedented attack we notice in people's lives. And Pastor Travis, and Rebecca, amazing part of our team, they worked in Texas he said, hey, actually, when we were doing construction in Texas, I did the best I could to record this statement. He said, when we were developing land in Texas, the moment you started construction, all the snakes would come out of the ground because you were disturbing the land they lived in. Catch that? When you started construction and you started to build in new ground, 
The snakes would come out of the ground because you were disturbing the land they lived in. See, the enemy wants you to think because there's snakes on the prowl, you're doing something wrong. When the Lord wants you to know you're actually doing something right. You're taking back land that he has designed us to establish his kingdom in. And this is what Travis said. We were building on land that was now ours, no longer theirs. So when you begin to establish kingdom in your household and the snakes start to come out, it's time for you not to be intimidated. We are not those that shrink back and destroy, but we take ground and stand authority over that which the Lord has called us to conquer. That's what we're doing. When the Lord's calling us to take back Bonita and take back this city and take back Haiti, guess what? The enemy ain't going down without a fight, but we've already won. That's the beauty of Jesus. And so the illusion is that we have to fight. No, we have to follow the good shepherd that leads us through the wilderness. Romans 8. Not Romans 8. Romans 8 is good too. Read that on your own. Deuteronomy 8, verse 15. Do not forget, 14, do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's a word for you today. He's brought you out of the house of slavery. Do not long to go back which, to that which captured you, to that which owned you. Who led you through the, get this, the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents. See, we're in the war of the wilderness right now. There's always a wilderness before that promised land. I think the illusion right now is that we think, if I just get through the wilderness, then I'll make it to the promise. If I just survive the wilderness, I make it through the promise, right? But here's the reality. We're living post-cross. We don't have to wander through the wilderness. We make the wilderness the promised land. Did you find that? I think that went over your head. Sean, you taught me to reverse these things. When we live in the Old Testament mindset, we think, I got to make it through the wilderness to get to the promised land. We now live post-cross. God wants to make the wilderness the promised land, but there's work in that wilderness. Are you hearing me, church? And so we try to wish away the wilderness. We try to wish away the difficulty. We try to wish this away. But here's what we have to understand. Is that we, as a church, God leads us to the wilderness because he is kind. And in the wilderness, he puts the wild back in us. A lot of us are way too safe and comfortable right now. We don't know what it means to fight and to survive. You ever watch like Rocky? What's the best part of Rocky? The training montage. What makes it, I mean, if you went from adversity to the fight, no, it's that training montage, blood sport. Every training montage is the best thing in the movie. You're in your training montage. Just pretend like that Rocky theme music's in the background when you're praying. You're there and you're fighting. He's training you. And so what does he do? He trains you, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, behold, I led you through the wilderness, the dry and thirsty ground. If you're in a place where you're like, it feels dry, stop wishing for water. We turn to Jesus, who is now the living water. So he says, I provided water from a rock. We now don't have to look for rocks with water in them. We have an eternal well named Jesus. What did he say at the one at the well? I have water you know not of. And what he's asking you to do is to be that fountain of living water for those that do not know what that water's like. You're an eternal well at your workplace. You're an eternal well at your school. You're an eternal well in your family reunion coming up with Thanksgiving when you don't want to sit with them. You are a well of living water. He then says, behold, I fed them with bread they did not know. Jesus then stands in John 6 and says, I am the bread of life. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst. And you're in the place and you're, he wants you to think about the snakes. He wants to think about the distractions. The enemy wants to think about all the stuff that's going on. And Jesus says, look at me. Look at me. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. And he led them through the wilderness. See, the, the most dominant theme throughout all of the Bible about our relationship with God is a sheep and a shepherd. That's it. Now, for some of us, 
We think sheep are cute. Cute little lambs. Sheep are ugly. Sheep smell. Sheep are lazy. We have these pictures. Sheep are dumb. Stop giving yourself more credit than you deserve. You know you have a face that only the mother could love, right? <laughs> That's how it goes. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is our shepherd, right? That's it. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not be in want. Now, we did a series on the shepherd many years ago. Pastor Bob and I got into it. We both went hard in our study. And I was convinced sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb. He said, sheep are smart. I said, no, they're not smart. So much so that I brought the linchpin argument, which we go back to that picture if we can, Jeff. See this picture of this sheep falling off a cliff? I said, Bob, this is why sheep are dumb. There was a group of shepherds that brought their sheep on a hillside to, to graze. 70 sheep. One went off. All 70 followed, and they jumped off the cliff. 10 sheep died as the other 60, the 10 broke their fall as they literally had a cushion of wool they landed on. Sheep are not smart. So that was the linchpin argument. But then it got settled. How did it get settled? On the Food Network. <laughs> One day when watching the Food Network, this, this sealed the argument. I was watching this special on lamb, Easter time. And this food anthropologist gets on and says, listen, a lot of people think that sheep are dumb. Many are. But there's a difference between sheep of the East and sheep of the West. That's what she said. There's a difference between Western sheep and Eastern sheep. Sheep of the East are wild and free range. Sheep of the West are fat, overfed, and domesticated. It's like, that's the church. <laughs> he uses the wilderness to get the wild back in us. And when he leads the shepherd, this is what was so unique as we studied the shepherd is the shepherd creates their own language with their sheep. And why do they do this? So that the other sheep don't listen to other shepherds. What does Jesus say? My sheep know my voice. And he speaks to you in the way you can only stand, understand so that you know the voice of the true shepherd, the good shepherd, the real shepherd. Psalm 23 was the first passage of scripture I ever memorized. And every day, I'll promise you this, <laughs> I feel for the, fear for the person that reads my prayer journal one day. They're going to think I'm highly neurotic. Every day, I've written Psalm 23.1 down in my journal for the last five years. Every day. Why? Not because I'm super spiritual. Because I need it. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. I will not be in want. I will not be in worry. I will not be in a spirit of fear. I write that for me. We need to know. It needs to be in your spirit. What did, what did David say? I wrote these on my heart. I meditate day and night. What's the word the Lord has for you to meditate on day and night? He's a good shepherd. As I memorized this and read through it, the one passage I never understood was Psalm 23, 5. It's a beautiful passage. I understand it in the context of David's life, but it never really was congruent with the other passages of the shepherd. It's this, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Beautiful passage. And I would always think of David sitting with King Saul, sitting at the king's table when he wanted to kill him. That was the picture, and there's probably a lot of illusion there that, that David's writing about. But the portion, I, you anoint my head with oil, is a shepherding language. And so what a shepherd would do is he would take oil and rub it on the eyes of the sheep and on the snout of the sheep so that the flies and bugs would not get in and burrow and get them infected. So it's a beautiful thing. But this week when I was studying, and I kept on studying about snakes in the Bible, this passage kept coming up. I said, what? What does this have to do with snakes? And I came across several articles, and I felt one captured it so clearly about what this means in regards to a sheep and the shepherd preparing a table for the presence of your enemies. Now, this is long. I'm going to warn you, but just capture this. Before shepherds would allow the sheep to enter a pasture to graze, they would walk every square foot of the pasture looking for holes in the ground. 
one and a half to two inches in diameter. These holes in the ground of the pasture are known to be home to poisonous snakes that lie in wait for a sheep or other animal to start grazing in the pasture. These snakes would come out of the hole, nip the animals on the nose, cause swelling, difficulty breathing, eventually would result in closing the airways completely, as well as an increased heart rate. The combination of these two things would usually kill the animal in a short time. To prevent this, from the snake bites from happening in the first place, the shepherd, catch this, would take his staff or rod and put it in the hole of the snake's home and then pour oil into that hole in a groove towards the bottom of the staff, allowing the oil to run into the snake's hole. This would lubricate the hole, which would prevent the snake from making it up the hole to harm the sheep. They would just keep slipping back down into the hole when they tried to slither out to harm the sheep. Once the shepherd was finished pouring oil into every snake hole in the pasture, he would then allow the sheep to come and eat in the field. The shepherd was literally preparing a table before the sheep in the presence of their enemies. This is the picture that God sets up for us. And we're wishing away the snakes. We're wishing away the wilderness, but God's saying, there's a feast for you in the midst of the wilderness. There's a place I've prepared for you in the midst of the wilderness. This is the promised land because I'm the promise, Jesus says. Right now you're in that place, that fight. I said, Lord, what are those snakes? What are the snakes you need us to deal with today? The Lord said two things. The snakes in this house are lies and luggage. Lies and luggage. I said, okay, I get lies. I get lies. What are the lies? He says, the enemy is the father of lies. John 8, that's all he speaks. That's his venom. That's his bite. 2 Corinthians 10 says, we need to take authority over every vain imagination, every philosophy of the world and submit it and surrender it to the obedience of Christ. Today's the day when you need to take those lies captive. Those lies have had way too much heyday and you've been in that place. That's the venom of the enemy is those lies have started to snip at you and bite you and you've meditated too long. And he says, behold, I've come to anoint your head with oil. I've come to renew your mind with Jesus. You must renew those thoughts. You must remove, remove the venom. You need to take authority over those things. I said, Lord, what's the luggage? What's the luggage? I was talking to Travis. Travis says, the luggage are the lies and the baggage the lies leave behind. I was like, oh. See, those lies leave a lot of baggage. Those lies leave a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. You're carrying a lot and it's time to let go. And many are on a journey with Jesus and you're saying, why is it taking so long to get there? It's so hard. I found this picture of this man on this bike. Do we have that picture with the bricks? If you've ever been overseas, this is how it looks. I mean, I swear to you. But a lot of you are, you're on your, your, your journey with Jesus, but he says it's time to lighten the load because the vehicle he gave you to get there can't take that weight that you're carrying. You need to let go of the luggage. Now, for a lot of us, it's past hurt, unresolved pain. But I'm going to push this further. I think for a lot of us, we like the luggage because it gives us an excuse to hide from the call of God. You like that luggage because you say, man, I can't. Look at all this stuff I got. For some, some people, that stuff is your schedule. You love being busy. You love it. Busyness is the idol of the American church. We need to break that altar. And busyness and the baggage. And a buddy of mine, Caleb, I was talking to him about this. He said, well, you should use that verse with, with King Saul. I said, what verse with King Saul? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. When Samuel's looking for Saul. I said, what do you mean? 1 Samuel 10, 22. So they inquired again of the Lord. Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. 1 Samuel 10. See, a lot of you are hiding from the call of God amongst the baggage. And he sees you. And it's time to let that baggage go. It's time to let those things you've been hiding behind go. Let's stand together, church. 
Sean and Amy, Travis, Rebecca, Brandon and Vanessa. Romans 16, verse 20. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of peace has taken authority. Why do we have this position? Why can we see the serpent's head crushed under beneath us? Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was wise, crafty, and cunning. See, Adam let that snake into the garden. We don't have time to break this up today. But the major sin that Adam committed was that he didn't deal with the snake in the temple garden that God had established. And so what does he say? He speaks to the serpent. Yahweh speaks to the serpent. And he says this. He says, behold, you'll be cast to the ground, but you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. What does it say? And Jesus, Isaiah 53, was crushed. He was bruised for our iniquities, the Hebrew says. And by his bruise, by his wounds, we are healed. And from that position, when he said, it is finished, he gave us authority to take back the ground we lost in the garden from that snake, that serpent. And for you today, it's time to take authority over those things you've let the enemy have a heyday in. You've let the lies come in. The snakes come in. God wants to set you free. And he wants to identify some of those lies you believe and the luggage you've been hiding behind. So just close your eyes, church. We're just going to allow the Lord to speak. Prayer team, you can come forward down to the front. I just want you to get into a place of prayer. We're going to call people forward here in a minute. But I want some of our leaders just to begin to identify some of those lies we've believed. that uh, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, it doesn't work. Amen. Uh, and I learned a long time ago that um, if we're going we're gonna to stick on my theme of marriage, I brought up today, that marriage has the power to set the course of your life as a whole. And so if your marriage is strong, it doesn't matter what happens outside of your home, you walk about, you move about in strength. If your marriage is weak, no matter how amazing life is outside of your home, you move about in weakness. And so I just sense that there is someone here and, and in your marriage, in your home, you look around and um, the enemy would say to you, man, things are never going to change. And the way I always like to explain this is that uh, he wants to have you take a picture he wants to give you photographic thinking. He wants you to take a snapshot of what life is like right now. And he wants you to think that things are never going to change, that your spouse is always going to be this way, that things are always going to be hard. It's always going to be difficult. You're always going to fight. You're always going to bicker. But God will say to you, no, no, no. I want you to have prophetic thinking. I want you to see those things that are not as though they are. Yeah, things are hard right now. But I've given you my spirit. Amen. And so when you think about your marriage, when you think about your home, the lies that we believe as far as what we see is not necessarily what God is saying is your destiny. Amen. Yeah. And so, Father, I just thank you for the marriages in this room. I thank you, God, that you have put us together. You said, what, have God, what God has put together, let no man separate. And so I thank you um, for a marriage. This is not our idea. It's not our cultural uh, you know, thing we've put together. Lord, this is you. You established this thing. In the very, very beginning, there was a wedding ceremony. At the very, very end of the Bible, there's a marriage ceremony. And everything else is just in the messy middle. So, Lord, help us to navigate the messy middle, but with the promise, knowing, God, that we have your spirit, Lord, that we can walk through anything as a couple because you are here and you're with us. Amen. I feel Holy Spirit wants me to address passion. I feel like he, I actually know that he put passions inside of you even at an early age, before you even knew what they were about. And you've been hiding them 
you've been suppressing them, you've been refusing to address them and allowing them to rise up because you've been told you can't do it or you feel unworthy or you don't have the resources. All those are lies. The Lord is here today to tell you that he would not have put those passions inside you if he didn't plan on carrying them to completion in you. Some of my words are a little specific here. Um, there are some of you uh, here that have felt like you have never done enough. Like you could have always done more in many different situations and you feel inadequate. And the Lord just wants you to know that he doesn't care about what you do. He's talking about your work, right? What you do. He wants your heart, just like that song said, I have nothing else fit for a king, but I give you my heart. He wants you as a son and a daughter. As a parent, I wanna give my kids everything, just like he wants to give you everything. And what's crazy is he showed me a picture of how it's all already stored in a room for you. Like everything you could imagine, everything that you could ever want is already literally prepared in a room for you and all you have to do is open the door and walk into it. It's literally that simple. It was beautiful, um, all the things I saw in that room. Um, there's also people that have been having uh, many dreams at night and you're, uh, you're actually waking up feeling tired and confused. And I saw the Lord showing you exactly what to focus on because he's speaking to you through those dreams. And they're actually leading you to emotional healing towards letting go of those baggage and those lies. And so uh, when you wake up tomorrow after your dreams, uh, I, I want you to actually just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want to say about those dreams? I just want you to spend some time with him and he's going to bring you revelation um, because a lot of people are waiting for someone on stage to give you direction. But a lot of how the Lord spoke to me, like I just asked him, like, I just asked him and, and he's going to speak to everyone in different ways, but he does speak through dreams. So ask him um, just a few more quick ones. Um, just speaking to uh, to Amy's word, you see other gifts and you say that you could never do that. So uh, I want you to ask the Lord, what's the lie you're believing that's keeping you from more of him? Uh, lastly, um, uh, as as before, even before he was speaking, I believe that there's a link between the the, the baggage, the lies, and limiting beliefs. Uh, the, the limiting beliefs are because you haven't dealt with those emotional things from before, which then leads to baggage, which then leads to, oh wait, there's a lie behind that. And so um, as we're saying this, guys, everybody just come forward that needs prayer. Like there's no judgment here. I want you guys to feel welcome. You don't have to wait till the end. Come up, receive prayer. The Lord wants to speak to you. Oh, these are the kind of services that feel heavy, but you should feel excitement because these are the kinds that you leave changed. So don't let this opportunity pass. This is exciting because this is when you get to rip out those things out of your life that you are constantly ask, asking the Lord as the word tells us, search my heart, oh God, and know if there's anything inside of me, any anxious way inside of me. Pull it out. So here we go. A lie that you're, you're carrying right now is that you have to carry the weight of your family by yourself. That's the lie. The truth is the Lord loves them more than you ever could. He created them. He knows their beginning, their current, and their, their future. He loves them more than you ever could. Take the burden off. You don't have to carry it alone. All you have to do is go, God, I give them to you because I trust you. I trust that you love them more than I ever could. The same sacrifice you made for me, you made for them. And I release them to you. Ooh, you're going to feel lighter. Then you can start praising for the victory over your family rather than, oh, God, please, 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 please. No, no, no. You're praising. 
So let's change that from here moving forward. You're going to start praising for your family. Thank you, Lord, for the victory in their life. Thank you, Lord, for giving them the finances they need. Thank you, Lord, for breaking that addiction. You're good, God. You're faithful, God. You're always there. You're always present. You've never left them. You've never forsaken them as you've never done for me. And I trust you in that. So we break that lie off of you right now in Jesus' name. I saw someone else and your mouth was shut. And you actually, if you think back as a kid, you were very vocal. You spoke a lot, and I feel like this is a female, but either way, receive it, whoever you are, many people. You were very vocal. You like to speak. You like to speak your mind. You love to be in front of people and speak, but someone in your life told you to shh, stop. You need to stop. That's embarrassing, or what you're saying is not relevant or valid and you shut it down and you can feel it all the time when you're in groups when you're around people you feel this like like I want to I want to say something but no I'll be good so we break the agreement that the, your words have no power we break the agreement over you that your words mean nothing that you have nothing good to say we break that right now in Jesus name your words are valuable and the Lord has given you such an incredible gift of wisdom that needs to be shared and let out so stop believing the lie and giving the enemy the power over you because once you release that not only do you benefit but every single person that your words of life spill over onto they get to soak that in and that's the ripple effect that the Lord wants the next lie is I'm not doing enough Ooh, that's a big one like he said our our biggest struggle is the busy schedule and you start talking to people and oh I got this and I got this and this kids in that and this kids in that and it's like whoa I'm just not so we break this lie off of you that you're failing you are not failing The truth is, is that you give yourself wholly to certain things. And it's about quality time, not quantity. And so we just loose you. And the mamas that are struggling and feel like you're failing your kids, that is such a lie. Break that off yourself right now. Look for the moments of blessing. Look for the moments that they turn to you and they say, Mama, I love you. That's the moments that you cling to, not when they're throwing a tantrum in the supermarket, like in the store. That is not evident. We had this women's retreat with Rebecca and I'm like, man, you see our kids do these amazing things for the Lord and you're like, clearly that was God on them. But it's interesting that when they do something bad, you go, oh, that was me. If we can't take ownership over the things God is doing, then we can't necessarily take over ownership over the things that the enemy's doing in their lives because they are an individual. They have their own walk with the Lord. You are there to steward them and guide them, but they do not rise and fall on you. They are walking their own life. And I feel like even right now, there's some that have a, a, um, some kids that are dealing with addiction that is not a representation of you and your parenting. They have a life that they're walking and it's part of their testimony and the Lord is walking with them through it. So we break off the lie that you're a failure as a parent. So Lord, we thank you for new mindsets. We thank you, Lord, that you're ripping out these lies and holding these snakes up and saying, no more. We thank you, Lord, that they get to walk through this with you and have victory in this, in Jesus' name. I have Travis Shear here. But just again, close your eyes. Those lies you've identified with something that was said today, lift your hand if that's you. Father, we declare freedom, freedom, freedom in Jesus' name. Come down to the front if you raise your hand. Come on. This is a moment for breakthrough and freedom in those areas. We want to pray for you and lay hands on you. So the enemy removing, or those arrows that were in the end, Lord was removing the arrows of the enemy. He's removing those arrows. All right. So one day I'm in the shower. And I'm asking the Lord uh, about a very difficult situation that me and my family are going through. Um, And I'm running all these scenarios in my head. Well, I could do this. I could do that. I could, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. Anyone ever do that? Anyone ever run some scenarios in your mind? How you're going to figure things out? 
plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Okay, so I'm doing that, thinking I'm, I'm really wise. And the Lord breaks in and goes, Travis, you need to renounce the what if spirit. I was like, uh, I don't know what that is. He goes, it's what you were just doing. I was like, oh. He goes, you need to renounce it. You've been doing it your whole life. And I said, okay, Lord, I don't know how to renounce that. He said, you say, I renounce you what of spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I said, okay, I renounce you what if spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this weight came off my shoulders that I didn't know was there. And I get up out of the shower and I'm like, yeah, woo. I get out, I tell my wife, and then I go right back into the what if spirit and I start running different scenarios. And then he goes, you're doing it again. I was like, oh shoot. I renounce you what if spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. And then I get in my car and we have a three day drive from California or from Texas to California. And the entire time I'm in the what if spirit running scenarios and I'm renouncing it and I'm running them and I'm renouncing it and I'm running them. And by day three, I have crazy breakthrough. I renounced the word of spirit yesterday as well. And that happened almost a year ago. So I'm still in process, but I feel like today there's a lot of people here that run the scenarios and the Lord has told me it's in the word. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries for itself. He wants us to be right here, right now. But if we're in that what if spirit, running those scenarios, trying to figure everything out, we miss him. And we're just full of lies of all these things that could happen. He told me, he goes, don't focus on what could be, focus on I am. There's no what if in heaven. It doesn't exist. There's the I am in heaven. It's only what is. So if that's you, and if you are running those what ifs, you need to come down, or you're invited to, come down, but you can also do it yourself. You can just say, I renounce you what if spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. And every time you go into it, you renounce it again. So Jesus, we thank you for freedom. Give it up. That's good. Powerful words. Thank you for freedom. We thank you for grace. We remove the lies. We come against the assault of the enemy and say no more. We take back the land that, the land that is rightfully yours. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Our children's ministry is now closing. So if you're a parent, please go up and get your kids and come back down. We want to pray for you. We want to make sure we gave those words before we released you. Worship team is going to go back into worship. Please come down the front. We want to pray for you. Lay hands for you. If you're online, please let us know how we can pray for you in the chat. Send us email, prayer at rockofrosal.com. We love you, church. Let's continue to believe for the freedom that Jesus paid for. Amen.